My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens 24-7. Now, I just referenced people who don't just follow the crowd. That is our topic today. We're going to wrap up Bold Thinkers Month talking about the art of insubordination, how to dissent and defy effectively. That is the title of a new book by Todd Cashdan, PhD. And Todd is a professor of psychology at George Mason University and a leading authority on well-being, curiosity, courage, and resilience. He has published over 200 scientific articles and his work has been cited more than 35,000 times. That is a lot of times. His books, Curious, and The Upside of Your Dark Side have been translated into over 15 languages, and his writing has appeared in places like Harvard Business Review, National Geographic, and lots of other media outlets worldwide. Now today, we're going to talk about why it is so hard to be insubordinate. That is a challenge that I struggle with, I have always struggled with, a lot of us struggle with that we are rule followers, but... There is value to insubordination. We're gonna get into that. We're gonna talk about how you can choose principled rebellion to go against the flow productively and not make enemies of everybody. And we're also gonna talk about some strategies that you can use to be a constructive rebel in your everyday life. Now, I do wanna make my small ask, the final one of the month for Bold Thinkers Month, go check out the merch at fomosapiens.com slash store. Maybe you're sick of me saying it, but I'm telling you, it's been really cool to get pictures of you guys wearing the gear. People are buying it, they're wearing it. They're becoming slightly more insubordinate <laughs> by wearing it. Okay, maybe I don't have evidence for that, but maybe. But go check it out and let me know what you think. You can always find me on email, Instagram, Twitter. You know where to find me. Let me know what you think of the merch. All right, and now on to the interview. As you know, I start every interview with the same question, and that's what I did with Todd. And the question is this, what's a formative decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? My first year of grad school, I was focused on how, to, how people develop panic attacks and what predicts the likelihood someone's gonna have a panic attack. And we would stick a, a 35% CO2 mask on people's face, think Hannibal Lecter, and we would induce panic attacks. I was sitting behind someone who was having a panic attack and I asked them, what does this get in the way of when you have panic attacks? And they described this huge list, spending time with their kids, playing Frisbee. And I realized I have no interest in studying the development of anxiety. I'm interested in what are the pleasurable things in life that anxiety gets in the way of. And that was the moment that I switched from studying mental illness to what makes life worth living. Did you actually go and like talk to the registrar and change your classes? Like, like what happened next? Um, I, I left my mentor and I worked in a different laboratory and I started studying curiosity and meaning and purpose in life, like literally within days. You know what? It's got to be just a happier life when you're focusing on, I mean, I'm not to dismiss the other field of study, but it's sort of like, it's just, it's studying, it's sort of like being an equity investor versus a debt investor. The equity investor is investing in growth, the debt, debt investor is investing in like, well, how do we not lose what we have? And so it's just like, a, it, I got to imagine it's just a better place to spend your time for you at least. Well, it's even imagining your conversations, right? Do you want to talk about someone having a grout or flood in their basement? Or do you want to talk about someone's trip to Santorini? Um, these are two different, very different fluidity in terms of what's going to happen next. Yeah, that reminds me, your story reminds me that my senior year in college, I came back from my study abroad in Argentina and I had taken statistics there, but really, basically, I was just having fun. And so I, I signed up for econometrics and I had to take a stats review and I didn't, I wasn't able to answer any one question and I changed my major. And I felt so afraid to do it because I was, felt like I was letting everybody down. I guess it was a little act of insubordination. And so that's why I wanted to talk to you today. Your new book is called The Art of Insubordination, How to Dissent and Defy Effectively. And you talk about, you know, basically 
going against the grain in a sense. And I got to tell you, that's something I've always struggled with. I find it really uncomfortable and many of us do. And I, but I ask myself like, why is that? So just to get started, like, why is it so hard? Yeah, well, there's actually a way to reframe what you just asked. I mean, first of all, you just described that you were living in Argentina and then we're talking yeah. about it makes me uncomfortable. There's nothing about being a principled rebel that is comfortable. I mean, the, mm. at the core element of being a principled rebel, which really just means is that there's orders, there's rules, there's authorities, there's societal norms that you're saying, these are dysfunctional. This is absurd. This doesn't make sense. And you, and there are two questions that you constantly ask. One is, how come I have this belief? Because I'm not that smart. And everyone else is saying the opposite. I must be wrong. So there's a self-doubt. So there you've got the discomfort. The second part you ask yourself is, man, if I follow through and say this publicly to my friends, to my coworkers, to my family, I risk being the, the product of scorn, of being negatively evaluated, rejected, socially persecuted. So there's more discomfort. So this, this whole arena, I love that you brought that up because that doesn't mean that you are outside of the realm of actually being will, willing to challenge the status quo. It means you are exactly where you're supposed to be, which is if you didn't feel anxiety and fear, that's what I'd worried about. That we're talking about psychopathy and sociopathy. Todd, you know, when you're saying this to me, it's making me think about, I mean, probably unexpected, but Disney movies. Now, why is that? Because I'm thinking about Belle and Beauty and the Beast. I'm thinking about, I believe his name is Miguel and Coco. And they always are, they're like the square peg in the round hole. And they have, a, I think there's actually like a name for the song that they sing. It's just like the seeking song or the, basically they're like, I don't fit in here. I want something different, but nobody will understand me. And it kind of sounds like what you're saying, because when you talk about this, this form of rebellion, it's not like you're saying, I want to tear down the world and blow everything up right. because I'm just being difficult. It's about saying the world that I exist in isn't fitting with the integrity that I'm seeking for me. So what am I going to do about it? Is that, what, you, do, what do you think about you that? You completely get it. I mean, you know, we could be having a conversation about Biden's Supreme Court pick. We could be talking about um, the presence of small, small batches of neo-Nazis in Charlottesville. But also we could be talking about the everyday things. We could be talking about why do we have clothing at Target for one-year-olds, onesies, where for the boy it says lady killer, and for this little one-year-old girl it says we'll never date. Those exist. And so we have social scripts that are built in from the second like a kid comes out of the womb. And we have the idea of the norm that women take the man's name and heterosexual marriages to happen there. And you can, and if you're choking on your food while you're eating at a restaurant, people ask you, Hey, are, are you okay? It's like, you can't, you, do you, did you want to have a conversation or are you going to save me and remember the Heimlich maneuver from your high school right. health class? <laughs> so there are all these little norms where we have to, by, by recognizing dysfunction, awareness there, being courageous enough to deviate from them, we slowly move the world closer to a utopian vision. And it really is these like singular norms and problems one at a time. And that's really what the book is about. It's it's the big things are important, but pursuing your own well-being, if it deviates from the normal path, like these Disney's movies like Coco that you're talking about, that's let's not ignore that doing something that is against what your parents, grandparents, and your culture and your religion are, are, are pushing you to do is an act of insubordination. And good on you if it doesn't detract from someone else's well-being. So I'm very curious, why you? Why is it, it, Why are you the one to talk about this? Like, what is in it about your own personal experience that got you interested and pointed you in this direction? Because, you know, you write a book, it becomes five years of your life. So you got to like the topic, right? Yeah. No, no. You, it seems like, you know, you know what it's like to be an author, the perspective. <laughs> I mean, for me is, well, let's, I'll keep the autobiographical part brief, but you know, my, my mom passed away when I was 12. I grew up in a 90% plus predominantly black neighborhood. So it was the conversation about code switching when I talk to friends, I'm like, it, it happens anytime you are the demographic or the personality type that is different from everybody else. If you don't have the numbers on your side, you're going to code switch because you seek to fit in with the group. And there are groups that actually are socially attractive that you want to be a part of. And so I would pretend that I listened to rap music when I loved heavy metal and I would wear clothes that did not match anything that was aesthetically desirable to me. And I did a good job of fitting in. And I had and my father was not around when I was a kid. 
And so I had to learn what it was like to be a man from, you know, Bruce Lee movies and Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. And, and, you know, those movies do not tell you what it's like to live in the suburbs and how to function in everyday life with other, other men to keep aggression at a low level and to interact with women where you're not focusing on romantic inclinations. And you can learn by trial and error. And I know you went to Harvard is the most inefficient way to learn is to just keep on making mistakes and failing repeatedly for two decades of your life. So that, I mean, with that backdrop, I always knew that I wanted to collect information and wisdom so that nobody has to have such an inefficient journey as myself to figure out how can you be the person without power and status and still find your human potential and maximize it in this world. When I became a scientist, I started studying well-being and marry the two together, 60 years of science, and then talking to people all over the world from Sri Lanka to South Korea to people at the DMZ border in Korea, and realizing that there are, there are very simple strategies that you start to package together, that you can be more persuasive, influential, and develop more fortitude. FOMO. FOMO. So we're going to talk about some of those strategies because I want to give people, you know, some real takeaways in today's conversation. But before we get there, I do sort of want to hear from you. It's always good. Like when you, like when you go climb the mountain, it's good to know that, you, well, hopefully you're climbing to the top. Maybe you're climbing around the side. I don't know. But I tend to try the, to go to the top. The oxygen level so, is low where I'm at. That's all I know. <laughs> Exactly. Well, as I've been, I always tell people like, you know, the view can be even better from halfway up, but let's just assume we're going to the top. So we're, if we're going to the top of the mountain today and we're trying to reach the point that you call principled rebellion, which is when you are, you are following an act of insubordination in a way that has a positive sort of end game. What does it look like when you get there, when you're in that spot of principled rebellion? I'm glad you brought this up. There's something very interesting that happens is there's often there is a switch and you forget the fundamental values and the motivations that got you there. You could think of the French Revolution as the quintessential example of this is um, Robespierre, who was one of the leaders of the, you know, the French reign of terror is when, you know, when they decide to rebel against the authority figures, you know, basically the kings and queens of France, um, once they gain power. They these the rebels basically killed anyone who disagreed with them or anyone that was part of the previous once majority and powerful. And no one has the exact numbers in the 1700s, but you're looking at over 10,000 people were beheaded or killed. Now, the interesting thing about this storyline and why it's relevant to the question is Rubes Pierre, when he was younger in his 20s, he was a lawyer and then he was a judge. His whole thing, and we have written documents, was we should never have a disproportionate punishment to someone for the crime. And we should not judge people by their malevolent acts because they are separate between the two. And once he gained power and he overtook, overtook the rulers of France, he did exactly the opposite. Now, anyone that disagreed with him was by immediately categorized as the enemy and they were beheaded. And they just kind of, it was a destruction of French civilization. We do this all the time when we are winners with our rebellions is that we forget, we forget to think about, we think about our end game, but we don't think about what's the end game of the cause and what are we going to do with the previously powerful? And so you think about, for example, why there's so much friction in American culture today. One of the reasons is, is that both political extremes, just playing with politics a little bit, has not thought about what are you going to do with the other 50% of the country other than demean them, demoralize them, and try to destroy them and make sure that they're impotent? That's not an effective, sustainable strategy. And so if you win on the progressive realm in terms of pushing for diversity, what are you going to do with all the, the men? What are you going to do with all the people that are white? And I don't have the answers, but you have to be asking the questions. And if you're on the right extreme and you're saying to yourself, okay, like we have to keep go back to this wonderful imaginary idea of the 1980s in terms of when, you know, we had structure and nobody got divorced theoretically. And there was, you know, and crime was controlled by, you know, a, a gluttony of, of law and order. What are you going to do with the people that are newly immigrating to the country, just learning the culture? You have to ask those questions. So at the top is not uh, a nice 
serene place of equanimity. It's a place where you have a lot of questions and you need a lot of humility. Wow. I did not expect that answer. Okay. So the principle <laughs> of rebellion, you get to the end and and you just have to figure it out and you can't lose track of the reason you started the revolution in the first place. Well, you know, your your mountain metaphor is a good one because the best mountaineers that survive Everest or would have survived if Mother Nature didn't decide to smoke crack and kill them is that they planned way ahead of time for all of the possible contingencies that can happen. So they make sure that they have a sufficient number of people there with extra extra bottles of oxygen. Um, they make sure that if the, if the natural elements are working to their favor, too much wind, too much snow, not enough visibility, they are willing to not go to the apex of the mountain. And they're able, and the strongest, best mountaineers know that to rest, appreciate, and be grateful for how far you came. And despite the fact you spent over $10,000 for that mission, they don't go to the top of Everest. They climb back down and they're proud of what they did. And you have to prepare for this. Yeah, I, it makes me think of all the people who had a vision for their life that was different. Like it's like Belle from Beauty and the Beast. She's like, you know what? I want to be a neuroscientist or whatever. And so she leaves and goes to Paris. Hopefully not during the time of Rope Pierre and, and gets her head cut off. This is later, inshallah. But anyway, so she goes and she does all the stuff, but she gets there and she's miserable because she like she kind of lost touch with her herself. So I can see I can see where you're going with that. We have to stay on top of it. Now, in the act of actually insubordinating and being the rebel, you know, I'd love to hear from you. You know, what are some of the things that we can do? in our real lives every day that will empower us to actually take the steps to, to, to be a, a rebel, but in a constructive way. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot there. It's open territory. That's basically the 195 pages um, of the book. So let's play with first is the myth of the lone genius or the lone creator. And okay. you can't successfully end a social norm innovate and defend a social cause are those people that can't protect themselves. You can't fix the criminal justice system by yourself. You can't alter, um, you know, mental health stigmas and reduce them on your, by yourself. So part of it is forming coalitions. And there's a couple of very concrete strategies that you can use. One is, is that while we are naturally inclined to be attracted to people that have similar viewpoints as us and look like us, that's just 1.5 million years of evolution. Uh, the science is very clear that the greatest way that we evolve as a person is by spending time and entering into close relationships with people who have different views than us, different philosophies, different social networks, and different backgrounds and histories. And that means they might not listen to the same music. They don't have, and you don't have the similar the similar place to start from. They didn't read the same books. You liked Haruki, Haruki Murakami. They read comic books. They love The Watchmen. And the idea is is that you will initially have a repulsion and a, to be to people that are different from you but it's exactly what you need to build and marshal your resources because what we know about the human brain is that when we think about how much energy do we have to climb the metaphorical or literal mountain we look to our left and right and see who is in close proximity to me that i can trust and that i care about and we actually mentally feel more energetic and have more to have more mental fortitude as well as endurance when we're close, when we have close trusted friends nearby than when we're by ourselves. And this carries forward into social interactions. I mean, you can just imagine like, you know, I'm from New York city. And if, if you've never been to New York city before and it's three o'clock in the morning and you're near Times square and there's a bunch of, you know, homeless people that are walking around, your blood pressure is going to go up a few beats per minute. So is your heart rate. Your legs are going to be a little bit shaky. If you turn to your left and right and you've got your trusted friends, even if they're geeky looking guys like me that are wearing, you know, suits with, their, you know, the, el the elbow pads and they've got uh, they haven't been in a fist fight their entire lives. Just knowing their physical presence is there is going to make you feel more strong. You're going to walk with, with a more upright posture and you're not going to look like prey to someone that's a predator that's on the streets. Yeah, I think mixing with other people, by the way, after so many years in New York now, I don't even notice. It's so funny. I'm like, it really takes a lot to turn my turn, turn my head. Like I saw a guy who had set up a full bedroom inside of a subway car yesterday. Like that was, I was like, 
wow, I turned my head to that. But but yes, it's, it's true. Surround yourself with people who are different. The idea of the lone genius. FOMO. FOMO. Our culture often suggests that, you know, all these great discoveries, they're all done in, in sort of a vacuum. But of course, what you're saying makes sense. You know, you need to be surrounded by other great people. Now, what else can we do? So another one is when we, we talked earlier about the friction of the self-doubt of wondering why everyone else isn't thinking like you, and then the no, mm. knowing that in the short term, you're going to experience some friction and some static. So you're going to have to deal with your own psychology. I mean, managing your own psychology is the hardest part here. So one of the mm. best evidence-based strategy, set of strategies that we have is called self-distancing. And so when you're in a work meeting, when you're with your family at Thanksgiving and you've got a range of political spec perspectives, same kind of social dynamic, speaking your voice is going to be challenging. Here's a few self-distancing strategies that can actually make you anticipate the anxiety that's going to come and work with it as opposed to having it push you to want to avoid, escape, and hide from what you actually think. So one is to imagine what would be the advice you would give your best friend in the same situation. We are really good and quick at telling our friends, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no. If you're attracted to that woman that actually you see every day on your commute, no, no, you, you have to go up to them. Um, here's exactly what you should say to them. Here's a question that you can ask them to kind of uh, you know, get them intrigued and curious. But when it's us, we don't, we don't have the same compassion for ourselves and we don't have the same level of bravery unless you have like an impulsive mood or some you know, hibiki liquid courage that's crossing through your veins. Another, another variant of self-distancing, and this is from Ethan Cross at University of Michigan, who's written a whole book on this, which is starting to talk about yourself in the third person in your head. You know, so Todd probably was babbling a little bit too long in that last answer. I wonder if Todd's going to be thinking more clearly uh, as he's talking so he can prepare something that's a little bit better of a soundbite for the next thing he's saying. As soon as I'm talking in my head in the third person, there's a, just a little bit of distance from my ego such that it takes away the sting and I can process information better so I can experience the anxiety. But I know that because I can say that I'm anxious, there's a part of me that's able to observe that anxiety and is not the anxious person themselves. Now, this sounds kind of trippy. It sounds like, you know, we should be drinking to have this conversation, but you have you have the physical experiences of these feelings. You can observe these feelings. So there's a part of you you want to tap of this observer self that allows you to be more resilient with life stressors and talking about yourself in the third person. And we do this all the time, naturally. Like, God, why was Todd such an idiot? And why did he, why did he actually laugh at that thing when he wasn't even, la wasn't even funny? Because now that guy's going to say something to him again the next time thinking that he likes his humor. We, we have these conversations with ourselves. That distancing provides um, a little bit of escape valve for managing anxiety a little bit better. And then a third way of self-distancing that you can use is treating yourself as a past Todd, a present Todd, and a future Todd. And so you think about what would future Todd say if I said nothing at this meeting that I'm finding all these problems in terms of where everything is going. And I kept these thoughts to myself. And what would future Todd say if someone else speaks up with the same idea, gets credit, gets a promotion, gets money, and improves the company that happens there? And just breaking yourself into future Todd and present Todd is enough to say, yeah, I actually want to give a gift to future Todd. Now, present Todd is going to experience some anxiety for it. But future Todd is going to freaking love me for speaking up about this. So we expand the time horizon and think a week from now, a month from now, which route will we will be will we regret or appreciate the most? And almost always, based on work from Cornell, we know that we regret inaction, not doing something, and it lingers and it's much more painful than the regret of actually doing something embarrassing. The cool thing about those strategies, by the way, and I've played around with definitely the present future kind of dynamic because, you know, I'll even write it down and then go back and say, okay, how did I feel later on? It's a really nice way to sort of, to sort of lock in what you just did there. But the great thing about these strategies, you can try, there's no downside other than the fact that 
I mean, if you're in the street and you're yelling your name and talking about yourself in the third person, people might look at you a little funny, but then maybe they'll just leave you alone. But there's no <laughs> downside of trying these things. Cause like in, you know, that's like a New York, <laughs> New York city thing too. Everybody's talking to themselves, but at the very least, I, I really like the idea of that creating the distance because, because even though you might feel a little silly the first time you do it, it is a strategy that the science backs. And so give it a shot. Now, I do want to ask you one one more question, which is this. Find me a leader who doesn't say, well, you know what, my team, I want them to be empowered to disagree with me. I want them to tell me the real skinny. But yet so many times organizations fail because the leader actually doesn't cultivate that at all. And, and as a result, you get groupthink and you think about, you know, a Theranos. I mean, there's a million examples, yeah. but, uh, you know, every time a company blows up, you find out that actually everybody totally knew what was going on, but they were too afraid to say it or they're disempowered or whatever. So as leaders, either, you know, in our business lives or our personal lives, like how can you cultivate an uh, environment in which people, you know, they feel empowered to be insubordinate in a constructive way? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked this question. And I'm glad you separate it. It's business and life. You know, if you're a parent, you are at least one of the co-leaders of the household. And if you're you're on a sports team, your job is, listen, whoever's the leader changes based on whichever game, whoever's performing the highest, whoever's got the most mojo that's happened there, much less in the business world. So here's a few really important strategies. One, so let's 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 even broaden leader further to whoever is the most socially attractive person in that room. It may be like, you know, if you and I went out for dinner with five people, when you speak and tell a story, everyone stops looking at their phone and they're like, oh, when Patrick speaks, like, listen, they're not going to say this, but they're basically saying, I want to curry your favor. And I also know that the rewards outweigh the cost listening to you speak and other people, people sit on their phones. You have a, you have a built in social hierarchies all over the place. And sometimes they're rigid. Sometimes they change depending on people's moods and behaviors. Whoever is the most socially attractive person that's there, to gain divergent voices, to extract information and perspectives from all the different people in the room, because you never know where the good idea is going to come from. You've got to learn how to speak last. So that's one. The silent, attentive, curious leader. And you'll tell them. You'd be very explicit about this. I'm not going to say anything. I'm also not going to say something at the end as if I know the, I'm going to be the Yoda that has the wise answer. Let's extract everyone else's ideas. Everyone's ideas are worthwhile. And then let's find kind of our job is to have the best decision making here, which leads to point two, incentivize group success, not individual success. If you don't incentivize how the group does, you're going to get people that try to be the star and they're trying to outshine other people and they're extra loud and they eat up extra airtime that happens there. So make sure you have some percentage of profit or you know, whatever, money towards parties or gifts for trips, whatever it's going to be, if the group does well, makes the best move, everyone gets a piece of theirs. Don't worry about the stars who say, yeah, but I did most of the work because you know what? Then they're not good team players and the group will never be greater than the sum of its parts. Sometimes it's better not to have stars there, which leads to number three. You want to create an environment where it's clear that critical thinking and independent thinking is the norm, not cohesion, not harmony, not positivity in the short term. This is hard for people to do. It's great when everyone laughs. It's great when there's levity. It's great when everyone's like really animated and we don't want people to be stressed. But it's most sometimes you're in a group, you're trying to make something great. You're trying to produce something amazing. You know, you're working for a film company. Um, even if you're an accounting firm, you're trying to get the numbers down perfectly that happens there. You want people to find the flaws and do not say, don't offer criticism unless you know a solution, because there is no correlation between the quality of the critical, the critical comments and the propensity to finding a creative solution. Maybe it comes from two different people. Why would you cut off any air supply that's going to help make the best decisions and the best products that happen there? which leads to, I forgot what number we're on, the next one that you want there, which is you want to make sure that the ideas come out independently. You want to rip out interdependence. And what that means is, is that if someone who is cooler in quotes, think like middle school or high school speaks first, you get an anchoring bias 
where everyone comes up with an idea after them that's kind of close to the cool cat who just said something. And so get those ideas independently. Bring them into the room. Don't attach them to people. This is also a way of actually taking it, leveraging the diversity in the room versus just getting diversity in the room. Because everyone loves to hire and recruit people of different races, genders, sexes, and cognitive diversity. But but basically what normally happens is in most organizations is the same three middle-aged white guys who love to hear themselves talk because they have no friends outside of work, they eat up 80% of the clock. So you get the ideas individually, you throw them in the middle, and then everybody actually evaluates the ideas separate from the messenger. And that's the strategy actually where you focus on the idea and don't worry about the articulateness or the personality of the character doing the work. I love that. You're divorcing the ideas from actually what happens in the room, which if what's happening in the room isn't effective, then you're never going to get them anyway. The name of the book is The Art of Insubordination, How to Dissent and Defy Effectively. If you want to learn more about Todd's work, you can find him at toddcashton.com or on Twitter at Todd Cashton. Todd, thanks so much for being here. You are amazing extracting so much stuff in 25 minutes or less. <laughs> FOMO Sapiens, we don't we don't have long attention spans. We gotta get done quick. <laughs> so thank you so much. I appreciate it. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.